From cheers of the fans to the crack of the bat, learn it all from Jimbo, Gabe, Mike, and Matt. Giving thoughts on all public teams, whether times are boom or if they are lean. Here are players that you should know, not only the good things, highs and the lows. Here it is, we're ready to go. Please enjoy the podcast, I'm in the show! Good morning, good evening, and good everything in between, and welcome to the podcast. It's our September 18th edition. The season's almost over. The postseason approaches. I'm your host, Jim Bobernicki, and I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Gabe Lerman. How are you doing, Gabe? Glaring at my cat, whose mouth cost me $6,000. Feline dentistry ain't cheap, yo. Oh, my God. That's insane. I mean, normal dentistry is expensive enough, but feline dentistry, that's that's a racket right there. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, the point is he will eventually recover and have many long years of pain-free existence, which is kind of the whole point. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's good. That's the most important thing. And we are joined also uh, in spirit in the future by Mr. Michael Bewey. How you doing, future ghost of Mike? They have banned me from the recording studio, and I'm now punished and forced to sit away from the cool kids table. And I've been staring at the wall for the last 12 hours. Glad to hear it, I'm sure. And we're joined also as uh, as all, well, not as always, but on the lucky occasions that we are joined by also another future ghost with you, Ma- Mr. Matthew Seibert. How you doing, Matt? Hey, all. I am waiting with bated breath, just as excited as so many other fans to see if 50-50 comes up. We've already had a legendary season from a Japanese baseball player who used to play in this league how can you not be excited about that? But I don't want to steal the thunder of somebody who's telling us where Shohei Otani sits in that quest right now. It's good to be back, even if it's a little strange structure, because, you know, normally I wouldn't be available for our recording session. All righty. And so with the ghosts here with us at the live show, we are now going to get into our top story. Ghost of Matt, what do you have for us in the future today? Top story. Right. Yeah, I just saw this and uh, I worked together a rough translation. So pardon me while I pull up my notes here to read about it. Again, this is a rough translation. So consider that essentially what's going on here is that NPB as an organization had a conference in Tokyo on the 18th. They were proposing a plan to add five games to the NPB schedule from 143 team games a season to 148 with aims on beginning said plan starting in 2026. NPB itself has seen revenues deteriorate since COVID-19 and proposed to the Players Association that each team adds one additional contest against other league squads. The Players Association chief, Tadahito Mori, said in response to the negotiation, quote, We are against simply adding games. The conversation revolved around the existing charm of our organization, the fans' positive response, or how we'd show something different, close quote, and that approach made clear there is still some discussion to be had. We don't have this plan's image right now, Mori concluded. So yeah. That'd be interesting. Obviously, there's still a little bit of time to get this negotiation done and push it over the finish line. But for the 2025 season in particular, we should not see any changes from the 143 setup, which, of course, means 25 games against all league opponents and a three game series against six of the other league's teams. We'll keep you posted if anything changes in any meaningful way regarding this before 2026. But don't expect too much change for 2025 at the bare minimum. And so with that, now we get into our Around the Horn segment where we take a look at every team from top to bottom. And men, let me tell you, we got a lot to cover today because we took two weeks off and it is really in the heat of the season. And we are starting off, as always, with the Fukuoka Soft Bangkoks. Seven and four since our last broadcast. And the magic number is now five until they lock up the pennant. They are now obviously guaranteed to finish in the postseason. It doesn't... Yeah, I mean, it's a winning week, but it still doesn't feel good. Somehow it all feels like it's slipping away, and the Hawks peaked way too early. These losses this week, and even though it was a 7-4 week, the four losses came to teams I really don't want them losing to. We had a series loss against Cebu, of all teams, and a series loss to the Fighters there. In my opinion, inevitable uh, Climax Series uh, opponent, but we'll see going into the postseason. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons I'm not feeling so good. First and foremost, uh, my boy, the boy, the man of men, 
Mr. Kensuke Kondo is now injured, deregistered yesterday with a left ankle sprain and um, trying to go for a stolen base, which I don't, I don't need you stealing. We got Shudo for that, you know? <laughs> um, so he's gone definitely for the rest of the regular season. Uh, hopefully he's back in time for the playoffs. Uh, that's, you know, it's 7.9 war gone from the team. That's like, that's the difference between them and the fighters, basically. Like, Kondo has been a superstar this season. I mean, all things considered, he'll still win the batting title because he's at 314, which is way ahead of anyone else. I think he's the only person in the 300s. But uh, you are correct, unless Ryosuke Tatsumi goes on a hot streak. This goes on a tear, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, you know, I I couldn't, we couldn't have lost anyone more important, honestly. Like, that really, really, really... Really, really hurts. Uh, but, you know, we got, it's not all negative. We got some positives. Mr. Hotaka Yamakawa has, in the way, same way that Kensuke Kondo has the uh, batting average race all tied up, Mr. Yamakawa also has the home run race pretty well tied up, getting past the 30 mark this week. Now sitting at 31. Uh, hopefully he can continue in the groove through the offseason. And, you know, Ukyo Shuto is also uh, leading the league in stolen bases. I didn't check exactly by how many, but he, he is still on top. And so it it just hurts. It's weird, you know, like we're the top team in the league. We're having winning weeks all the time. It just feels like things aren't going to go well once it actually gets to the postseason. I just got the jitters. But at least Lima, uh, Levan Moinello is back on track, striking out seven while only allowing four base runners over six innings after his disastrous start a few weeks ago. It's good to see him back on back on the uh, positive trail. And uh, congrats to Mr. Akira Nakamura, the lefty sniper, who played his 1500th career game on Sunday. His career started back in 2011. And while we are losing Kensuke Kondo, Mr. Roberto Osuna has returned to Japan as of September 7th, and he is getting ready for a postseason run. Uh, he was a bit spotty throughout the season, but is still obviously one of the more talented closers in the league. So... We'll see if that'll be the boon that the Hawks need. But, man, like I'm saying, while they've been dominant all season and they are still on top, it's it feels so weird to say the 7-4 and four two-week stretch is bad. But it it doesn't feel good. The ha- the fighters are the only team I'm scared of, and they are coming. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's scary. I've got one more update for you, Jimbo, and this oh missed both of our notes. Kensuke Kondo may be injured for the rest of the season, but guess who's rehabbing? Uh, Yuki Nagita, right? Yes, he is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was thinking that. I was like, I remember we were talking about Yanagita maybe coming back for uh, for the postseason. So that would be great, man. That would be that would be some storybook stuff right there. If Yanagita just came back and just went on a tear and won yet another Japan Series title, that'd be cool. That'd be great. But just uh, vintage Yuki going to town. Hell yes. That'd be that'd be fantastic. But so that brings us over to my aforementioned worst nightmare team coming up, the Hokkaido Nippon Ham Fighters. Take it away, Gabe. Six and three since our last episode, with one game being postponed. Six and a half games up on the Marines and Eagles. 13 games left to play. Can we celebrate yet? I'm not too confident until I see that little X next to the team name. But there, there's going to be at home playoff games against or at S. Confield Hokkaido. I am so excited. Hiromi Ito pitched his league-leading fourth complete game shutout earlier today against the Hawks, scattering nine hits and two walks while striking out nine. Way to go, Hiromi. That top of the rotation between him, Kakayuki Kato, and Sachi Yamasaki continues to be frightening. You really want to face them in a best of seven? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely oh, yeah. The, the not. fighters also have a winning record against every other PL team now. Fran Mil Reyes continues to be an absolute beast. He now has 20 home runs in only 90 games. He leads the team in slugging percentage, even though he doesn't have enough at-bats to qualify for the batting title. Equally goofy hot over the last little while. Kotaro Kiyomiya, all of his 12 home runs have come in the last two months or so. Guy got hot, and it's what's keeping the fighters in the postseason chase along with Fran Mill. One last note, congratulations to the ageless reliever, Naoki Miyanishi, who now sits tied for fourth in the career appearances leaderboard with Takao Kajimoto, a Hall of Famer who pitched 19 seasons for the Hankyu Braves, mostly as a starter. And yeah, you know, you mentioned there with the with Kiyomiya being hot and kind of leading them on this run. That's the thing that really scares me about the fighters is that I feel like the Hawks peaked way too early and are now like really just kind of stumbling to the finish line. While the fighters just seem to be picking up steam and they are the last team I want to see in the playoffs. But that looks like where it's going to go. And uh, that's scary. <laughs> Hottest team since the All-Star break. 
Yeah, the only team that have a winning record over the Hawks, as far as I know. And uh, yeah, it's again, it's if there is any team I don't want to face off against, it's them. But speaking Big of Boss hot... Shinjo likes this post. Yeah, seriously. But speaking of hot teams on the come up, that gets us over to a new third place team, the Tohoku Rakuten Golden Eagles. Take it away, Ghost of Matt. I get to talk about the Eagles for once as a first on podcast for me. Anyway. They are 7-3 and three in their last 10 games, and as of today, they are ahead of the Marines on percentage points, and they have five games in hand. Let's go! <laughs> I'm excited because I used to be uh, I used to be an eagle of some stripe in high school. My, my school's mascot was an eagle. Anyway, enough about that. It's going to be interesting to see them get back to the playoffs, and obviously they're in good position to do that now since they're already ahead of the Marines, and they still have five extra games to go. Speaking of their star players, though, Takayuki Kishi has thrown a lot of innings as he turns 40 this offseason. The right-handed starter is the first pitcher in NPB history to win 60 or more games with two different Pacific League clubs. His previous employer was the Lions. But another Eagles pitcher making history recently, Takahiro Norimoto. He's only the third pitcher in NPB history to earn 100 career wins and then accumulate 30 saves in a single season. The other two you've probably heard of before. Legends of the game in Yutaka Enatsu and Koji Uehara. Of course, Uehara ended up playing in MLB for many years as well. Another start on the farm was accomplished for Masahiro Tanaka back on September 13th. He threw 98 pitches across seven innings. Still no word on his call-up status, but he's stretched out and he's throwing gas again. He might be back in time for the playoffs, and the last time he was on the Eagles in the playoffs, good things happened, as I remember. Anyways, that should cover us for the Eagles today. I honestly did not have the Eagles making the postseason. This is the power of Toshiaki Imai's leadership and the stalwart offense finally showing up. Man, if Makun comes back in time to lead this team on a pennant drive or a postseason drive, that's storybook. Yeah, that's some serious storybook stuff. Yeah, the Eagles have been like one of those really weird teams all season where they're always giving the the Hawks a bit of a run for their money. And uh, yeah, just like kind of inconsistent, but looks like they're getting it together at the right time. And it looks like it could be like last season where we have a real like last week showdown between the Marines and Eagles to get into the playoffs again. For context, the Eagles started the season 18 and 27. They're now four games above 500. Yeah, I mean that's that's some serious stuff. But speaking of a speaking of the team that is faltering now and stumbling near the finish line at fourth place, our Chibalote Marines take it away. I'm going to assume a very uh, sad ghost of Mister Michael Bealy. <laughs> I can hear the the void growing in the distance in the time of space. Anyway, let's take a look at the Marines and how they've been since we last spoke, which has been probably at least two weeks now, I believe. September 11th was the last time the Marines recorded a win. That was against the Oryx Buffaloes. They beat them 12-3, but it's been a bit of a slide since then, losing 7-6 on September 13th to Cebu, and then the following day losing 1-0, and then after that getting swept, losing 7-1, pulling a Brazil-Germany, and then on September 16th, losing again 1-0 to Cebu, are we having fun yet? And then yesterday, they lost 5-4 to four to Rockton. And then today, lost 8-1 to one to Rockton. So, that will get you sent back down to the fourth place. Um, obviously, still plenty of games left. And they can get right back into that third place spot. Possibly coming down to the last game of the season once again, as it did last year. Or at least the last couple games. I'll go more in depth with uh, player performances in a little bit here. But, um... Yuki Kuniyoshi's scoreless streak ended yesterday at 24 games as he got tagged for two runs in the loss in extras against the Eagles. So unfortunate to see that. However, on a positive note, congratulations to Riku Kikuchi on recording his first NPB save against the Buffaloes on September 11th. The 2022 first round selection has a 1.29 ERA in 17 appearances with the Marines, so outstanding to see there and hope to see more success from him in the future. Outfielder Akido Takabe sprained his wrist and is out of commission for the foreseeable future. Unfortunate to see that, however, it is fortunate that the Marines have like seven capable outfielders, and 
who knows how many down on the farm that are just waiting for a chance. And a bit of an interesting note here from Wata Ika on Twitter that was posted back on September 6th about how the Marines have been hit by a serious power drain compared to the last two seasons. Hisanori Yasuda went from 9 home runs to 0. Toshiya Sato went from 8 to 3. Koki Yamaguchi went from 16 to 2. Something, maybe, maybe not, going on with the ball. But I was inspired to actually look at something based on the, um, the power drain. I was just remembering all the... Midnight matinees featuring the Marines and baseball for breakfast broadcasts that we did, you know, last year and this year. And one thing that always came up with Marines games, especially at home, was that Gregory Polanco is the world's biggest victim when it comes to home runs robbed by the wind. And I actually just wanted to take a look at the wind direction charts from the last couple years because when, you know, Brandon Laird and Leonis Martin were with the Marines from 2019 to 2022, they didn't really seem to have a problem yet yeah, like the wind would you know keep stuff in the yard but Lane, uh Brandon Laird I mean had two 30 plus home run seasons and then he was injured and then had a down year and then Lenny's Martin had two 20 plus seasons and he always seemed to launch him far so I actually did take a look at the uh, wind for the location where the uh, basically at Zosa Marine Stadium I couldn't pin it exactly right there but it's close enough for my uh for research purposes so looking at uh, the maps and using Google Maps and then, you know, pictures and everything, Zosa Marine Stadium's home plate is in the north. It's facing the north direction. And then that left field wall, or the left field, left center, is south. So I actually pulled up these wind direction charts plotted for from this year all the way to like 2016, I think. But I was only looking from 2019 to now. And 2019 and 20, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021... The wind charts are actually very interesting because they blow in from a lot many more directions, including blowing in from the north, from behind the players as they're batting, blowing towards the outfield wall. And then I looked over at 2022, 2023, and 2024, and this. And I just want to add on, this is looking at um, the months where that are during the playing season, and then also at the times uh, when a game would be taking place. So this is excluding, you know, late, you know, the AMs, early morning, late, stuff like that. And also excluding, uh, like I already said before, the uh, months they're not playing. And these past couple years, especially 23 and 24, the wind is blowing in predominantly from the south, which, you know, Marine Stadium already has, you know, wind from that being literally right next to the ocean. The ocean breeze is blowing in. But there's almost, there's very little variance and, and very little change in direction these past couple of years. It's pretty much just been all southern wind. Um, aside from, like, some gaps in previous years, for example, in 2019, July to August is pretty strong southern wind all the time. But then it goes right back to having a good degree of variance in um, the end of August, September, and then into October. But, for example, looking at 2023, it's... There is a lot of southern wind just blowing, you know, the, the balls back, keeping the ball in the yard, especially, you know, this year. There's just not that much variance. I don't know what's causing it. I'm not a meteorologist, but I guess that could explain what is going on with the ball, at least at Zozo Marine Stadium. That could explain a bit of, you know, a power loss. I mean, I'm not going to say, you know, without that wind, they're launching 40, 50 bombs, but... There's quite a lot of home runs that are literally just dying at that warning track. It hits the track and I think just falls off, which was, um, you know, as a Marines fan, just getting really annoying because I've seen it a couple times where they smash it and then, you know, they're walking like they got all of it to first, like not even, you know, not, not like walking like, oh, great, it's a flyout. Like they think they got it and no, it's caught right at the fence. Sometimes it's not even close. It's like just it's at the track somewhere. So I was kind of curious to what's causing that. And um, if anyone can get Mike Trout, the meteorologist, on the phone, let me know. Maybe he can explain it. And speaking of analyzing things, a couple episodes ago, we were talking about um, Neftali Soto, as we've talked about him all season, how good of a pickup he's been for the Marines. However, August was not up to his standards. He actually had the worst August of his career uh, this year. Uh, putting hitting no home runs, collecting only five RBI, striking out 30 times. 
Um, I'm posting a 220 average. I don't have the uh, the advanced numbers up in front of me right now. Actually, um, he had a I see now he had a 77 WRC plus this year. The 286 slugging, 304 on base. Just everything about um every pretty much every metric that you can have. He's pretty much had a uh, the lowest of his career in August this August, this past August, 2024. So, um, we always joke that, oh, you know, the, uh, the podcast is a jinx, it's a curse, you know, players listen to it and prove us wrong. Well, I mean, there is a pretty good case that any, any part of that could be true because pretty much immediately after I <clears throat> had said that, he went on a tear and his tear is continuing. Looking at his current September as it stands right now, September 18th, 2024, he has seven home runs He's gotten a 15 RBI, um, seven strikeouts. He's only struck out seven times so far. He's got a 409 average right now in the month of September. Um, it's just he's been doing really good. Two doubles, eight um, singles, 18 hits overall so far. He's just had a really good, um, really good these past 12 games. And then even in August when he was not performing up to his standards, at the very tail end of August, he was getting um, singles and doubles back. So I don't really know what was going on there, but, you know, just a slump. Uh, right now, looking at um, some of the advanced metrics, his WRC Plus for the month of September is 349. With a Woba of 619. Uh, batted balls in play average, bat pip, whatever, 367. An OPS of 1445. And on base of 490, so he's having a really good um, September so far. As I've said, his strikeout percentage right now is actually only 13%. Usually he's hovering around close to 30, really. So it's really I'm, I've been really enjoying see that uh, seeing that so far. And he's even had a couple of games this month where I, he's had two home run games. Um, I'll have to double check that real quick, but it's been a couple. I think at least two or three. Actually, the magic of not doing this live, I went back and checked. He only had one two-home run game. That was on um, September 10th. But I believe Polanco had one, and I've been regularly seeing both of them pretty much hitting home runs so far in the um, in the box score in the morning when I wake up or when I remember to check it, you know, when on my way to work or whatever. So, yeah, he's been doing really well for them, and I can't really complain. The team's scoring, the team's standing as a whole, yeah, you know, it's an issue. Hopefully it'll get rectified and, you know, they'll be back in third place. But, you know, as for the performance of both him and Polanco, Polanco's been great all month too. You know, hopefully they can get back there. Just get back to that third place and just keep destroying baseballs and that's really it. That's all I can say on that. And then before I close it out, I'll take a look, quick look at uh, Dallas Keuchel. Uh, he pitched today actually in the 8-1 loss. Uh, he allowed six runs over four innings, four of them earned, only two strikeouts, walked three. So, he's been doing pretty good. I I really couldn't complain with his performance so far. This is so far the only real issue that he's had. I'm, you know, he's an end-of-the-season rental. I mean, I would like to see him back next year. That would, if he, you know, comes back from this and pitches really well, and if they make it back to the playoffs, you know, if he pitches well in there, yeah, I'd like to see him back next year if the, you know, if everything's right. So, but yeah, that's all for me on the Lote front, and hopefully I can be back here live next week or whenever that happens. Um, hopefully this gets spliced in easier. I hope this isn't too much of a hassle to cut. Looks like I rambled on for almost 11 minutes. Um, if, yeah, that's all I got. And uh, yeah, I mean, I totally get, you know what? I haven't heard what he said, but I agree. It's just, it's brutal to see the Marines kind of falter like this, but it's, they're not even like that bad. It's just been like a bit of a, like a spotty stretch. Unlike the Eagles where they've, I mean, it's like the Eagles where they've been kind of inconsistent all year round, but now they're getting cold at the wrong time while the Eagles are getting hot. And I mean, that's baseball, baby, right? And so that brings us over to a team that is still struggling and fighting to get through the season. The fifth place Oryx Buffaloes take it away, Gabe. Only one win since our last episode. They've lost Oof. seven in a row, including back-to-back -back shutouts at home against the Hawks. I think they're toast. I think, unfortunately, Buffalo's fans, the season's over, effectively. At least the fans are still turning out. A new single-season attendance record and the first time the club has drawn over 2 million fans in their history. 
Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, Osaka's going to be a Buffalo's town by decade's end. None of this Tigers nonsense. Speaking of seasons ending, a quartet of career Buffaloes will be hanging up their cleats in the last games of the season. I think September 24th will be the celebratory finale for a few of these players. Takahiro Okada, most prominent among them, a.k.a. T. Okada, over 200 career home runs and a career 771 OPS in an 18-season career. A home run title and best nine in 2010, a Golden Glove in 2014, and of course, a Japan Series ring in 2022. He's a local boy from Suita City in Osaka Prefecture, beloved by the Buffaloes fans as their home run king. And to show his dedication to the craft, he even played in the Puerto Rican Winter League in 2019 to regain his form. And sure enough, he got back to double-digit home runs for the two seasons following. Reliever Motoki Higa will be calling it a career, declining any celebratory ceremony or what have you. The 41-year-old debuted in 2010 and picked up 93 holds and a 2.68 ERA over 418 appearances. Mm -hmm. I liked his strategies as well. He started using a larger glove to hide his pitch grip and in 2021 switched to an all black mitt for a more enhanced effect. I gotta like a guy who prefers chicanery and sleight of hand. Ryoichi Arachi, an all-star infielder in 2018 with 127 stolen bases and 36 home runs. He got an ulcerative colitis diagnosis in 2016 that dramatically reduced his playing time, but he still made a... 140 appearances in 2018 and 100 in 2021. He's also donated a portion of his earnings to the Japan Inflammatory Bowel Disease Association the last three seasons to raise awareness and funds for other sufferers of his disease. His Wikipedia page mentioned he's transitioning into being a coach, so he's still going to be sticking around Kyoseta Dome, just not playing. And finally, Yuya Oda an outfielder who joined the team in 2015 and got in 101 games in 2021 as a defensive substitute, only one for 18 at the plate. His best season at the plate was actually last year with a 753 OPS in 77 games as a super sub. What's wild is all three of those batters, Tiokada, Adachi, and Oda, got hits in the ninth inning against the Marines in the 2021 Climax Series Final Stage Game 3 with Oda's walk-off fake bunt double sending the Buffaloes to their first post-merger Japan series. They would lose that one, win the following year, and lose last year. What a run for this core, and I'm excited to see the new players show up to replace them. Like, whole Naito got his first hit at, at the NPB level as a 19-year-old. A ringing double. I actually got to see that one live. Next crop is coming. So I bet you this is going to be a one-year blip. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you remember at the beginning of the season, I thought the Buffaloes were going to win it all anyway. So, yeah, I think it'll just be a one-year blip and they should be back. Um, what is a what is a walk-off fake bunt double? <laughs> all right, so mention. what happened in this case, uh, I think the, the go-ahead run was standing at second and Yuya Oda was faking to bunt. So the infield was drawn in. And then as the pitch was thrown, Oda pulled his bat back and did a proper swing and snuck it past the first baseman and into the right field corner. Okay, that's pretty solid, actually. That's, that's some good stuff. It's a, some... The, the clip's available here on uh, the Pacific League English YouTube channel. Just look for Yuya Oda, O-D-A. I am going to do that after the show, and I encourage you, listener, to do that as well, because that actually sounds like some good old-fashioned proper baseball right there. And so that brings us over to the last place team in the Pacific League, the team that has been there all season, but for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, I've got a lot of positive things to say about them. It's the 6-5 and five since we last spoke, Saitama Cebu Lions. 6-5, and five, it's a winning week. Is that the first winning week we've had? Maybe. I don't know, but it, it feels like it. And maybe they got the, the, the benefit of the doubt by it being a two-week stretch, but still, it may be too little too late, but... I'm finally starting to get a sense of positivity and competitiveness throughout the team. And so, yeah, we got a lot of positive stuff going on this week. Natsuki Takayuchi had a perfect game going into the seventh to still come up with a complete game shutout instead. It was broken up by Neftali Soto. And you know who the last rookie to do that? A little guy by the name of Daisuke Matsuzaka. And 
I mean, like all season long, the the pitching has been great with the Lions, but now it kind of feels like the hitting's not doing as well, but it's just getting enough, just enough run support to actually pick up some wins. And like you look at what's been happening over the last two weeks, we got Natsuki with that aforementioned shutout, got uh, Imai thoroughly outperforming Roki Sasaki on Sunday, striking out 12. Chihiro Sumida got in on the action with his best game of the season, racking up 11 strikeouts through eight while only allowing four hits. This Lions pitching staff is so good, and Kaimataro is not even there. Like, this could be such a deadly staff next year if they just, I'm talking just a little better with the, with the sticks, man. They could be a solid baseball team. And there's some congratulations to go around to Mr. Shuta Tonosaki, who punched his 100th career home run on September 7th. And congratulations to his infield battery mate, Mr. Sosuke Genda, on playing his 1,000th career game. And I also wanted to point out in the last week we had on Sunday 15th game the, against the Marines, they celebrated uh, recent soon-to-be retiree Yuji Kaneko's retirement. They had like a bit of a celebration game for him. He had a little press conference. And uh, yeah, the, he was going around all the different parts of the outfield. He played center and right throughout the game. They rotated him around so all the fans got to say thank you to him throughout the game. He had a bit of a rough day at the plate, but he made an amazing sliding diving catch uh, I think around like the fifth inning or so, and the fans went absolutely mental uh, when, when he was out in left field. It was it was just a really nice thing to see. Everyone was really happy. They won the game by like six runs. It was just a really fun. And of course, if there's a team you want to beat, it's the Marines, right? And even though the Marines have been beating the crap out of them all season, and the last couple games, they're actually getting up on them, which actually kind of goes to show with the way the Marines are going in the standings now. Maybe the Lions have the opportunity in the macro to deny them the postseason, which is some spoilerific a, activity mwah, going on. Beautiful oh, yeah. behavior. Uh, but not hanging up the cleats is Takumi Kuriyama and Takeya Nakamura. The two 41-year-olds, still with Cebu, will enter their 24th season, and it's the only team they've ever played for. And look, while this season has been a total, thorough, unquestionable, pointedly pointed disaster of a campaign for the Lions. It's good to see that there's a little bit of life going on. The pitchers are still dealing. The bats are kind of finally starting to get into it. Attendance is still pretty, pretty good considering how bad they've been all season. Maybe yeah, next they've been season. averaging like 20, 22,000. Yeah, yeah, fan. they're still averaging like 20,000 a game. And like the fans seem to be having fun. And, you know, that's the most important thing, right? People are still showing up. They're still supporting the Lions. And, look, next year can't be worse, right? I think, in theory, <laughs> like, they got to do better next year. Right? I Only if the dome lid collapses, then it's worse. Yeah, that's about it, yeah. <laughs> the dome collapses or if all of the pitchers forget how to pitch. But, hey, man, I'm going to try to be a little more positive. I think the Lions could be decent next season. I don't know about playoffs yet. They definitely need a bat or two or three or four, but we'll see. They need to find a foreign batter who doesn't immediately stink. That would like, be let's good. not forget. They signed Jesus Aguilar and Franchi Cordero and have promptly disappeared them. Yep. No, yeah, they've disappeared off the face of the earth. It would be nice to get a good foreign sign. I would, but also it'd be really good if they could draft. Uh, I mean, listen, you guys have done really good at drafting pitchers. My God. No one's done it better except maybe the Buffaloes. If you could just get a hitter now, like, again, great job getting Sosuke Genda. Fantastic fielder. We need hitting. We need people who hit the ball, please. <laughs> like, damn, man. But so that brings us over to our familiar faces in new places. Gabe, how are the boys doing stateside? Well, let me just take a quick look at the game that's going on right now to see if Shohei Otani's hit another home run. Two home uh, runs and two steals. He's done it. He's done it. Well, he, ha he does have a steal today. Oh, oh, I was joking. Yeah, he, okay. <laughs> no, no. Shohei Otani now has the first ever 48 home run, 49 stolen base season. Incredible. What more can you say? Yeah, so it's Gabe from the literally the day after we recorded this episode. Shohei Otani in Miami today gets stolen bases numbers 50 and 51. And home runs number 49, 50, and 51. I do want to highlight two other pitchers, though. Former Saitama Seibu Lion, Yusei Kikuchi, since coming to Houston, 5-0 and in nine starts with a 3.19 ERA, 0 0.94 whip, 59 strikeouts against 12 walks over 48 innings pitched. Yeah, 
pretty good. And now leading the charge for Houston as they punch their ticket towards the AL West title. And now that he's back, we can talk about the ace of aces again, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, former Oryx Buffalo. He's made two abbreviated starts for the Dodgers since returning on Tuesday the 10th, but both were four innings of scoreless ball. In his first start after three months away, he struck out eight batters over the first three innings. Oh, he's Big mad. He missed a lot of action, and he's champing at the bit to come back. I love how big of a competitor he is. Yeah, no, it's it's great to see him doing well, and obviously it's amazing to see Shohei Otani doing it. I just love that the guys are dominating stateside, and, you know, NBB is as good as ever with uh, everyone being competitive, and things are awesome in the world of Japanese baseball. Jeez, Otani, so good. It was great to see Yamamoto back as well, carving up that lineup. Goodness gracious. If they get that him back in time for the rest of the season. <laughs> but that brings us over to the end of today's show. And we have a question for you viewers from us to you and you to us. What is the worst injury you've ever suffered? Uh, I right off the top of my head, I was thinking uh, there was some like stuff when I was a kid when I like fell on my head. And also like I like um, a glass pane broke and I cut my wrist. That was pretty bad. But as an adult, um, I tore my left rotator cuff. Oh, man, okay, there's left rotator cuff oh. and I was cleaning a window because I was just, like, moving the windows really fast out of the thing and then, like, out, just blew my arm out. It sucked. Uh, but then also I was playing in a charity softball thing when I worked at a radio station. I, like, totally messed up my right knee uh, running to first and then the guy tagged me and I kind of – my whole body turned and my knee decided not to turn and that didn't go well for me. That was brutal. Uh, but yeah, uh, one of those two, I guess. What about you? I managed to pull both my quadriceps running from home to first base after batting in softball back in university. I don't know how I managed to do it, but needless to say, I was limping for a little bit afterwards. Hell yeah, man. The Triple H special. Or is it the Kevin Nash special? Or is I, it the I can't Vince remember, McMahon dude. special? It's one of them. One of them did that. I think it might have been Vince. I think they might have all done it, actually, now that I'm still thinking about it again. And uh, what about you, Mike? The worst injury I have ever received, um, if you're talking physical injuries, I don't believe I have one. I've managed to stay healthy for the vast majority of my entire life. Um, I think the worst things I've ever really gotten is, like, you know, when your nail cracks too far up and the air gets under your skin... I've stepped wrong a couple times, and, you know, I've jammed my finger. Like, really nothing severe. If you want to talk mental injuries, uh, don't work with the public, kids. It, um, it hurts. Substantially. Don't do it. Well, I'm sure that was awful. I don't actually know what it is, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm very sorry to hear that happen to you. And what about you, Matt? Worst injury I've suffered. Man. I've been pretty lucky, actually. Like, I can't think of too many major injuries. Not that like anything required surgery or that took me out of, out of like health for a long period of time. A couple of stories that I remember, uh, both of them involved our backyard and my older brother. Um, one time I ended up like crashing through a couple of like those plastic deck chairs because we were trying to replicate like some james bond mission impossible repelling stunt off the deck and um yeah my brother didn't have gloves on his hands when he tried lowering me over the rail so yeah i broke those but the helmet kept my head intact i didn't have any major injuries or scrapes um another one we were playing football and i tried catching a catching a football by like jabbing my hand at the football and caused a hairline fracture in my pinky it meant that I couldn't play violin for a couple of weeks because I had to wear a splint, and that was really annoying. But, uh, I mean, it's really minor injury, a hairline fracture. Woo. I guess one other one that does come to mind, and again, this wasn't too much of an injury. There was this big, big hill that I remember trying to bike down behind my older brother and a friend of his. Our moms were close, and so we were all out together. And they start racing down the hill and I'm like, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be with my mom. So I'm riding to catch them up and I uh, hit this curb and the bike literally goes somersaulting with me on it. 
and I end up like skidding across the road and the bike goes flying. My helmet again was on. And so I didn't have any major injuries, just some scrapes and maybe a bruise to my ego. But uh, I was young enough that I recovered quickly and I don't remember there being any like needed surgery or major injury out of that. So like I've been super lucky and nowadays I'm not too, uh, you know, active in such a way that I'm risking a ton of injury either. So I guess I'll take it. Being healthy is not a bad thing. Oh, gruesome. Horrific. The worst thing I've ever heard, I'm sure. You know, Jimbo, now I'm starting to you know it's starting to sink in how difficult it is to act against a green screen when you're dealing with like animated counterparts no i like it it's fun i can just say whatever i want we can just see how it goes afterwards <laughs> it's like mad libs <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i'll just say just say just say anything like wow that doesn't sound like a bad injury at all you're silly for even thinking that should hurt <laughs> and that brings us to the end of today's show uh, thank you as ever for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe, do all that youtube stuff, and get ready for the postseason. Please subscribe to PLTV, catch the end of the season here, and catch the postseason, and we will see you next time on Pacific Week TV on the podcast. Take care.